nature has made this the perfect hideout. Disappear all the way down here, and who would ever find you? Until now, Queenstown's main claim to fame has been its pioneering of the bungee jump. But these days, it's attracting a very different kind of dropout. This place has emerged as a surrogate international life raft. It's become a sanctuary for wealthy Americans and others so scared of terrorism, they've opted for the ultimate sea change. There's never been any doubt that New Zealand has the scenery and, well, rather a lot of it. The vast majority of overseas tourists come from Australia. But the thought, or perhaps the prejudice, has always been great for a holiday, but who would really want to live here? Well, the answer now is a great many. Quietly, this has suddenly become the great escape. The world's a scary place today. It's in turmoil. You know, it's, there's, there's a feeling of being threatened out there. Come here, it's, you know, it's a safe haven. Yevra Ornstein is typical of the new so-called survivalists who believe in surviving in some style. He's bought this exclusive lodge in a spectacular location on the outskirts of Queenstown. Originally from Washington, he moved here in September 2001, right at the time of the Twin Towers attack. I went from a, you know, an environment quite frightened very, very traumatized to coming back here, where it's worlds away. I want, you know, the way I described it, it wasn't, it didn't only feel like a world away, it felt like worlds away. And, you know, maybe this sounds selfish, but, but to be quite truthful, this is where I prefer to be. I don't want to live in, I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to, I don't want to be in a place where people are concerned about being attacked. A regular visitor to Australia in the past, he's convinced the streets here are now much safer, not least because New Zealand refused to sign up as a member of the Coalition of the Willing in Iraq. The survivalists believe that by coming to the South Island, they will drop right off the terrorist radar. And New Zealand's a neutral country. It has no enemies in, in, in the world. Uh, they've not been... You know, they, they haven't been imperialistic. Uh, they're like Switzerland in the sense of being quite, quite neutral. It's not just Americans heading for the hills. Following the bombing of the London Underground, some of the normally more stoical Brits are rushing for the exits as well. When you saw it, what did you think? Uh, wow. <laughs> We'd spent a couple of weeks looking at properties um, around the area. And um, we came out here and uh, we just... Well, we fell in love with it instantly. Fell in love with it instantly. And, uh... Helen and Peter Shaw moved in six months ago, buying this not-so-modest mountain retreat. One of the bombs that didn't go off was the tube station that I would have used every day to go to work. And that just reconfirmed that to, be, to live your life in this beauty and this safety is fabulous. And, yeah, one does feel secure here. If, it, if one thought where one would like to be, um, I, I think if you did a poll, a lot of people would say, well, as far away as possible, and New Zealand is probably about as far away as you can get. Since the survivalists started arriving in Queenstown, it's been raining real estate agents. Al-Qaeda is the developer's friend down here. We were shown round the newest townhouse on the market. Well, the best is up in this area here. We've got the, the kitchen here, which is a real feature. This has got a home granite bench, and it's all got soft shutting drawers. And uh, very nice indeed. Mm. And of course, this is this is your main bit. This is the main living area, which is obviously here because it gets the best of the view. 
And Thanks to the survivalists, property in Queenstown is now more expensive than the central business district of Auckland. This three-bedroom home, for instance, could be yours for around 2.2 million Australian dollars. About 80% of my inquiry is from overseas at the moment. And for, especially for properties of this level, there's a lot of inquiry from Australia and England and also America as well. And there's been a huge property boom? There's, we've just come through a huge property boom. Give us an idea of the scale. In the last year in Queenstown, the property values have increased probably 25%. And over the last five years? Uh, in the last four years, 70%. For the Queenstown posties like Dave Yates, more houses mean more work, more sorting, more walking, but no more money. Locals like him earn about $15 an hour. Affording any sort of home in your own hometown has suddenly become an impossible dream. Not surprisingly, there's resentment. It has to be said that's quite true. Um, well, I feel that's quite true. You have got the locals who work hard, live here on a daily basis, and they're not on great money. And then you've got the super rich who come into town who have truckloads of cash, and they're throwing it around like water, uh, building colossal homes. And um, they just keep, keep coming. They keep arriving with money to burn and the ability to make it all happen, really. Do you think it's expensive here? No, I don't. I think it's um, remarkably good value. You sound very, very <laughs> pleased about that. Well, we are, but we, we don't like to shout too loud about it because we don't want to spoil it. But, yes, it is. Um, when, when you come from England, um, living in New Zealand is um, great value for your money. We have... There are some locals, however, with the wherewithal to compete with the foreign raiders. Actor Sam Neill was brought up on the South Island and has returned to stay. They grow organic vegetables down here. Very Prince Charles. It is very Prince Charles. You've got, and you've got sheep over there as yeah. well. I, try to, I do bad watercolours. All right. He does good watercolours. <laughs> I do bad watercolours. <laughs> I'd like to see your bad watercolours. Whatever the two men's differences, they do share a distaste for what developers are doing to their respective lands. I have mixed feelings about that, frankly. I mean, I, I welcome the idea of immigrants from all sorts of places in the world. At the same time, I don't want to see the place chock-a-block, you know, and as elbow to elbow with each other. I think one of the reasons that it, this is a country that's relatively free of tension, is that there's... is we're not overcrowding each other. Driving around his country estate in his vintage ute, he is personally proud that New Zealand didn't send combat troops to Iraq, but struggles with the unexpected consequences for this small corner of his once perfect world. I don't mind admitting it. I'm uh, fairly nostalgic for it, for the days when these were all uh, shingle roads here. There was no tar ceiling. New Zealanders like to have a big second home, and um, and uh, Australians and Americans like to have a big second home here. And you, you know, this, it's only a small country. There's only so many fields that can sustain big second homes. But as if the survivalists were not enough, Sam Neill's backyard is also being assailed by another more perplexing band of invaders. You guys um, pretty instantly recognise this place, eh? So here we are. This I don't, is sorry, where is it? <laughs> this is the Skipper's Canyon, and this is the area they used to portray the border for a winner. Welcome to the world of Middle Earth. In Queenstown, you're also in the heart of Lord of the Rings territory. These devotees have come to see the real-life locations 
where the award-winning trilogy was filmed. And uh, this enormous waterfall or cascade of water comes down the uh, river in the shape of white horses. And that comes around the corner over there. Add some special effects to the scenery and you get this. The South Island was the real-life backdrop for much of the mythical and mystical epic. OK, guys, after all our excitement, we're um, heading into the peaceful little town of Arrowtown. These people are on a two-week Lord of the Rings tour, visiting just about every major location. The film has brought people here who would normally never have dreamt of coming. Many, of course, are now planning to stay. Being among them is a bit like entering a parallel universe. Well, he's my bear Elijah that I bought in England, yeah. and I brought him with me. Um, Elijah is my favourite actor in the film, so I called him Elijah. And then when we went to the cloak factory, he got an elven cloak. And then he's also had his foot tattooed with the elven nine by the, calli <laughs> by the calligrapher who did all the work for the film. You are a bit balmy, aren't you? I am totally <laughs> obsessed with Lord of the Rings. And I've seen all the films, the last one I saw 25 times at the cinema. It's hard to overestimate the effects the film has had. Whole industries have sprung up to cater for the incoming fans. The national economy is still basking in the glow. The Ring fanatics are also sure the author, Tolkien, would have approved of setting the film in New Zealand. They believe the country's foreign policy matches the film's anti-war message. For its part, the central government in Wellington has been very quick to put a price on all this. It's determined to cash in on the survivalist bandwagon. As a result, if you're rich enough, you can now effectively buy your way into this country. A residency visa is yours, as long as you've got a lazy $2 million to invest in a government-controlled account. As New Zealand's Prime Minister, Labour's Helen Clark made the decision not to send troops to Iraq. It was a key plank in her campaign for last weekend's national election. The outcome of the poll is still too close to call, but for her, this was one issue never really open to negotiation. I think that many people look at New Zealand and see a haven of tranquility in a troubled world. It also happens that we're physically very distant from anybody else. Our nearest neighbours, Tonga and New Caledonia, are around 1,100 miles away. Uh, so geographically we're safe, but I think there's also a feeling of sanctuary about New Zealand. You're getting more than your fair share of rich and famous, aren't you? Oh, we're doing very well with people who show an interest here. There's uh, uh, the odd person who's uh, made their hundreds of millions in the United States economy who finds sanctuary here in New Zealand. Uh, there, there is an issue, though, isn't there? A serious issue. Do you think it, it's morally right for a country, as it were, to sell a visa? I think that we would not be the only country that had an investor category. Uh, New Zealand needs investment. Uh, as a country right through our history, we've been short on capital. We import the savings of others. We haven't been great savers ourselves. So having people able to come here with investment uh, resources that they can put to use in New Zealand actually helps our development. Suddenly, star spotting has become a big part of the New Zealand skiing experience. There is an eclectic mix. Canadian country rock superstar Shania Twain and the former Premier of New South Wales Bob Carr are among those to have invested in the area. I'm gonna get you I got you inside. I'm gonna get you at the local newspaper, the editor at large is known by everyone simply as Scoop. In every way, he is a thoroughly old fashioned journalist. 
and all the better for it, preferring to be in the pub as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. Well, I want to show you this bar, Michael. It's uh, called the Boiler Room. It goes okay. off at night. <laughs> You'll love this place. Well, I don't think there's anybody who knows this town better than you. What are you having? If you want more of a real handle on why this place has become so popular, Scoop, typically, is the man with the story. In terms of crimes against person and, uh, you know, rape, murder, we just, you know, as I say, just don't seem to have it at all. Can you give us an idea of the sort of crimes that there are? I mean, some of your recent front pages? Well, I mean, we just, we do a police column and, I mean, someone knocking over mailboxes in the countryside, you know. So knocking over a mailbox would be a big story. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> it gets reported, you know, so maybe that's a good litmus test, isn't it? You know, the scale of things. You must be one of those sort of happy reporters in the world, so that when the London bombings happen, for instance, or 9-11 or happens, that must seem like a, a different world to you. You know, in a funny way, when you hear about that, you almost say, well, there's a, that's just added to the value of this town because you just know there'll be another wave of, you know, immigration almost, you know, because people will... will I mean, we, we've noticed that since 01, you know. For the first time in its history, perhaps, the tyranny of distance is now actually working in New Zealand's favour. And I remember what it was like walking off the plane and walking into the airport in Auckland after being back in the States for three weeks. And my first two thoughts and, and I mean, I remember it very clearly, impressions were, were calm and civility and no fear. Ask any real estate agent in Queenstown and they'll tell you that that lack of fear is a priceless commodity. New Zealand has always offered isolation, but never before for so many has it seemed quite so splendid.